I'd like to invite you to the inaugural, I don't even know what to call it. It's a podcast, and I'm going to be talking on it, and it's probably going to be less edited and more stream of consciousness than most of the podcasts you're used to. And if we get a fancy intro and outro, uh, we'll let you know. And you might hear me uh, talking about some of the companies I'm involved with as advertising. And hopefully it gives you some insight into the type of stuff that uh, this audience is usually looking for. So this podcast is about, well, it's about a lot of different things. But specifically, we're going to talk about prepper, survivalism, and those types of homesteading, etc., types of topics on this podcast. And it's going to be more of a raw, unedited feel, kind of like a conversation with someone or maybe even a lecture. So if I get boring, you're just going to have to give me some feedback and tell me how to change it. But uh, I think it's uh, a little more interesting to have a conversation with someone or listen to the life experience of someone who's uh, been in this industry for a long time. And uh, of course, I'm talking about myself. Uh, I'm a digital marketing agency owner and I do a lot of work in writing and content for the internet and for readership all across a bunch of different channels for marketing and a lot of those words that we write as an agency each year probably somewhere in the to the tune of eight million or so words uh, happen to be in those affiliated uh, industries or niches Um, within the prepping community, within the homesteading community, within hunting, fishing, and survivalism, etc., etc. My background is a little bit different probably than most. Uh, I was a gunsmith, at least started trying to be a gunsmith at the age of 12 and really got into um, the different aspects of prepping, survivalism, hunting, uh, gunsmithing, building guns, that sort of thing, and made a relatively successful career out of it and have kind of dabbled uh, since around 2006 or 7 in uh, what I do now, which is running digital marketing campaigns. So for today's episode, we've got a sponsor, and this is a website that we're affiliated with and you can go and check out their website, which is around the topic of preparedness and survival and homesteading and those types of things. Uh, and the link you'd want to click would be uh, in your browser. You would type in D-F-I-L dot link, D-F-I-L dot link, L-I-N-K slash A-1, D-F-I-L dot link slash a1 so today's topic uh, one of the today's topic is going to be you know parts that you need to have on hand uh, when you're using what we refer to as the AR-15 or some sort of modern sporting rifle uh, that modular componentized uh, sporting rifle that makes sense for so many different things so it's clear that AR is a mainstay, you know, in the tactical areas, in the prepping community, in the hunting community. I mean, when you have something that's so modular and so readily available and so easy to understand as a builder and as a user, uh, it kind of transcends the marketplace almost to the point with the AR where it's become monotonous. However, some of the concerns you might have as a prepper or somebody who believes that there's going to be a sustained period of time where you need to rely on your tools and won't have access to what we might refer to as the outside world or you know the infrastructure that we enjoy today uh, or, or really for those that are just wanting to be in the preparedness mindset not necessarily with the idea of Armageddon or global financial collapse or you know the zombie apocalypse uh, on the horizon I think it just makes practical sense to take a look at, you know, what really from the perspective of someone who has a a mindset of preparedness, what should you have on hand uh, when it comes to using the AR system, you know, that, that you can help to allay your concerns 
should you get in a position where you can't find some of the stuff readily available. And some of this happened during COVID uh, where you couldn't get parts or even during periods of high demand where, for instance, legislation might have been teased and tickled uh, to where it might go into play and people were buying up, you know, whole part kits in mass or whole firearms in mass that you couldn't find certain things on the market. Certainly you couldn't find specialty items. You know, there was a period of time there where the 6.5 Creedmoor was so popular that it would sell out in minutes every time that somebody would deliver a set of stock to a distributor or to a retailer or to an e-commerce uh, platform. So it's important to understand from that perspective where you might look to kind of bolster your defenses so that you don't run into an issue with uh, not being able to find spare parts and that sort of thing. So what do you prioritize when you're talking about the AR-15, you know, the, the M4, the M16, whatever variety you choose? I mean, clearly the civilian models are going to be more popular and more readily available, but I'm sure there's a few of you that have uh, somehow found your hands on some pretty interesting variants of this, uh, you know, modular sporting rifle. So obviously the goal of this discussion is to kind of talk to the importance of having uh, parts on hand, you know, understanding how they work together, understanding where a lot of the wear and difficulty comes, you know, on the parts perspective, meaning which ones are working harder than others, which ones do you have to be worrying about failure more than others, which ones are super integral to your daily maintenance routine or making sure that you don't run into problems uh, should you not be able to find those parts readily available. So I, I think the must-haves on your workbench or in your armory or whatever you want to call it, however you have it set up, maybe you just stick a, you know, an old ammo container full of parts in your gun safe or in your closet. But spring kits, I mean, these are things that you have to have more than one of, right? Even if you're just disassembling your firearm in the field or, you know, in a in a cluttered room, you can miss a spring here and there uh, just by turning your head half a second while removing a detent or a cup or a, you know, screw or whatever. So spring kits are important. You should have more than one. You know, the essential springs come in spring kits. There's, you know, multiple parts in there. Uh, usually they have the detents and the cups and the covers and things that come along with those uh, different parts uh, of the AR-15. Uh, a replacement trigger group can usually be helpful and generally speaking, if you bought a stock weapon and then you customize it after the fact with a custom trigger, uh, you should have your parts on hand and I keep them on hand. I'd probably have a couple extra uh, springs uh, that revolve around the trigger group. Um, a full pin replacement set is an absolute no brainer. Again, these are, these are absolute must haves. Like you cannot, it doesn't make sense to own this firearm without having these extra parts on hand. If you don't, you don't shoot enough or you haven't experienced a failure uh, where you need to have these on hand in the real world during real world activities especially those where you need to count on a gun for reliability for hunting or for defense or whatever and those that have that preparedness preparedness mindset are going to run into difficulties if they don't have some of these things on hand so spring kit replacement trigger group if possible but for sure spring kit and full pin replacement set right and there's a lot of pins there's roll pins there's detent cups there's, you know, straight pins. You need them all because you never know what's going to shear under pressure. If you have a double load on accident, if you, uh, you know, knock your gun really hard, you know, if you smash the edge of one of the pin holes on your aluminum receiver with a steel punch, there's a lot of things that can cause a problem and not having those pins on hand and those springs on hand is going to be an issue for you. Uh, but for sure, those are important. I'd also carry an extra gas tube and I would match it to your, you know, your most important uh, upper. So if you've got a, a mid-size upper, you've got a full-size upper, obviously you're not going to try and mix and match parts. Get the thing that's the direct replacement from the gas tube perspective. Obviously, if you're running, you know, a, a gas system instead of a, a impingement system, a direct impingement system, you're you're going to replace the idea of replacing your gas tube or having an extra replacement gas tube with having parts on hand to service those gas systems. And as reliable as they are, a lot of people are making the decision to stick with the direct impingement concept because the cost and the difficulty of replacing parts for 
reasonable cost in a gas system, a fully gas system, is uh, is significantly higher than it is for replacing a you know twenty dollar gas tube or a twenty five dollar gas tube. So uh, have those things on hand if if you're running a gun that runs a, a fully gas operated system. Make sure that you've got the component parts there, uh, the scrapers, the replacement parts that make sense for that. Okay, uh, a carrier key and screws absolutely no brainer uh those things come staked from the factory because they've always been a problem They're, they've literally flown off a hundred times uh i've seen it so many times when shooting or testing a, a gun and it's not just because i staked it wrong it's because those things fail and that's why they're factory staked most of the time so that you, you know they can get to those ten thousand round counts and stuff like that so uh carrier key and screws uh you know absolute must have uh extractor and ejector no question right that's that is right up there with like the remington 870 ejectors and the glock ejectors right like one bad drop on a case and you need a new extractor you need a new ejector so there's a lot of things that can fail there and there's you know springs driving those and, and that sort of thing so that's why those spring kits are also important but extractor and ejector absolutely must have uh buffer tube and spring is is slightly less of a must have i guess because they're pretty inert objects when it comes to the AR-15, but if I had to stake my life on it, and that was the one system that I had, you know, committed to, and I didn't have a backup, I would absolutely have a backup part, you know, replacement parts for the buffer, and the tube and the spring. Um, magazine rebuild kits, no-brainer, especially if you keep them loaded. Yeah, you hear all these stories about, oh, I can load my mags for 10 years, and it's not okay. Cool. One day they're gonna fail. You know, as good as spring technology is, as good as metal. Uh, metallurgy and metal technology is right now and as good as the manufacturers have gotten this process of heat treatment um, you know and tuning springs properly it, it's an absolute no-brainer at 11 bucks to have extra mags or extra mag kits on hand that are not in use if you if you're loading your mags to keep them ready at all times great make sure you got extra mags that you don't load so that you don't have any problems with spring tension going forward if you do uh, with the others and if you don't anticipate having issues with spring fatigue or something like that, have rebuild kits anyway. Sometimes base plates get blown off. Sometimes followers break. Some of these things are made out of plastic and polymer just doesn't hold up the same as steel or aluminum. Steel and aluminum mags have almost gone the way of the dodo when it comes to the AR-15. So it's important to understand, you know, rebuild kits make sense. In some cases, California, there's such a dodgy gray area, uh, for instance, or even New Jersey and New York with magazines that you need to look into the compliance concerns with that. Rebuild kits are almost non-existent for that situation because you really can't have certain things in place. In California, at one period of time, and possibly, hopefully, they're gonna be uh, reversing this law eventually as far as the, the magazine style and capacity and the ability to buy regular factory capacity magazines. But there are all kinds of issues that come along with those. So make sure you're looking at your jurisdictional uh, regulations and, and falling within those guidelines so that you don't put yourself on, you know, in an uncomfortable position from that perspective, but have rebuild kits on hand or have extra magazines on hand for sure. Um, some of my favorite magazines, you know, we'll list in an article. Um, and most of these podcasts that we're going to be doing are based on articles that we're either writing for uh, one of the websites that comes off of or uh, one that's been written in the past by myself or has been, you know, something that I've championed throughout my career. And as somebody who writes about, as an agency, 10 million words in the firearms industry every year, um, yeah, there's a lot of that. So we'll probably cover some things more than once on some of these podcasts if we keep doing it. Of course, it's going to bear out this being the inaugural message that we're sending, whether or not the audience actually likes this type of stuff and whether it makes sense for them to listen to a podcast like this. So this is our inaugural episode for a gun podcast that has no name yet, but we're pretty sure we're going to keep doing this. So we built a website, and uh, that website is guns.rohpodcast.com. That's guns.rohpodcast.com. So we invite you to take a look at that website, give us feedback, tell us how bad we suck, and let us know how we can improve and yeah, we're looking forward to doing this thing, but uh, obviously these first few episodes are going to be pretty minimally edited, and we're going to try and fight our, find our feet here uh, as we get going.
I'm going to do a quick shout out to a friend of ours and somebody uh, that we're affiliated with as a company. It's a company based out of Iowa, and uh, the owner's a, a real good person that's in this, or at least tangentially affiliated with this industry. He runs a welding shop that makes custom fabrications for uh, people who hunt and shoot, uh, need safe rooms, modular uh, componentized uh, housing structures or barn structures, that sort of thing. So he's right up the alley of the people who might be listening to this, you know, gun safes he can make, those types of things. So we invite you to uh, check out his website at twinangelweld.com twinangelweld.com and uh let him know that you checked him out as a result of listening to this podcast and so he can know where he's getting all these or at least the seven of you that are listening uh coming to his website we appreciate it basic maintenance tooling like a barrel wrench you know having side adjustment tools having carbon scrapers um you know having a punch and a hammer uh, a punch set really i mean having a roll pin punch set would be nice but you could probably make do with just a standard you know through hole punch set uh steel is not a problem right as long as you're like being accurate and making sense of you know where you're placing the hammer blow so that you don't you know widen the hole unnecessarily or something like that aluminum is is, you know, when it comes to the AR receivers and polymer even uh, nowadays, it's going to get damaged if you hit it the wrong way. And it's going to, you know, leave scars and marks. So be careful, you know, when you're, you know, measure twice, cut once type of thing. Make sure that you're driving pins out the right way. Uh, having a roll pin set is helpful for that. But, you know, most of this stuff can be purchased at like a Harbor Freight for pretty cheap. The amount of times you're going to need a punch set to work on your AR-15s is not particularly high. I mean, even if you're tinkering a lot, you might use them five times a year, 10 times a year. Um, and that's pretty random, you know? So it's important to have those things on hand. Um, also, you're gonna want, you know, rag solvent, cleaning equipment, uh, those types of things. I prefer using something like a dry grease or a dryer grease. I use a uh, molybdenum disulfide or what a lot of people would use that are substantially similar to like a choke tube lube, something that's either graphite based or molybdenum disulfide based or copper disulfide based, because I feel like there's some value there between the dissimilar metals where you're not shooting hot oil on your face every time you, you know, fire the gun. Of course, if you've got that much excess oil in your, in your, um, bolt carrier group or in your trigger group or anything like that you're doing it wrong so make sure you understand how to maintain these things and we'll have future podcast episodes and or articles on the sites that we're affiliated with that will talk you know to some of that um as well i think you should have some blue loctite um i think it's 242 loctite but i could be wrong this is again most of what we're doing on this podcast is kind of stream of consciousness consciousness me just talking as I'm sitting in front of a microphone trying to recall some ideas. So it's not necessarily scripted. Um, I, I believe the number is 242 Loctite is what you would use. It's the uh, the medium blue uh, colored Loctite that you find in the little tubes, uh, even at your Home Depot. It's great for like um, being able to adjust set screws or being able to adjust scope screws, uh, you know, scope rings and bases and that sort of thing. Um, on a base or on some really hardcore screws, I'm not going to move. I'd probably use red Loctite, which is significantly stronger and actually can be really difficult to break free from an aluminum uh, thread if you're using a steel screw. So I prefer for the R15 using blue Loctite because it's a little gummier, has a little bit more flex, and it's a lot easier to break the seal. Uh, and also, you don't have any leaching concerns like you would with a, a harder or a higher level Loctite. So I prefer, I think, again, I think it's uh, 242. But if you know if you really want, you could uh, look into using red, especially for certain areas that are not going to get much adjustment. Uh, so, how often should you should you check into the wear and tear of of your rifle, right? Like if you're maintaining a rifle, you know what does it make sense for, right? Um, and I think anytime you have a malfunction, right? Like obviously, if you've got something that doesn't feel right, or you've got something, you know, round in seat properly, or something didn't feel like it went off at the right level of sound or 
you know, you felt like your gun's a little janky right now, stop what you're doing, figure out what's wrong with it. Take a look at all the critical components. Look for, look for scratches, look for, you know, obvious wear and tear, look for cracks, look for broken parts, broken edges of extractors, um, you know, bent gas tube feed openings, that sort of thing. So those are important. So for sure, if you're multiple inches off of target on a shot and you're like, what just happened or something didn't feel right, stop and check what you're doing, right? So if you're in the field, if you're doing it, if you're using it and you feel something like that happens, stop right there, check it out, right? Obviously, if your life is in danger, that's a different thing, you know, in a defensive situation, you want to make sure that you're taken care of. And that's why we stop and kind of review and revert on, on these types of, of scenarios, right? So when you see it in real time, stop, check it out, look for obvious causes for concern. Um, how much lube should you use and and why? And I touched on this a little bit earlier, but you know, generally you need a lot less than you think you do. I mean, a lot of people like to squirt oil in there and just leave it in there. And the problem with that is oil, when put into tight cavities and places, causes pressure. Because even if you don't think it, is taking up mass or space when you put the pressure of you know a, a sammy spec round in there or higher you're you're adding different torque to different areas and where the contact points are or where the channels are that need to be uh need to have movement oil can actually act as an inhibitor uh to the movement and that can cause a malfunction in itself so you need a lot less oil than what you think you do and to be honest like I said before, I like using drier lubes for the AR-15 because I feel like because of the specifications on an AR-15, which and, and the old story is, oh, the AR-15 is not as accurate as you know my my hunting rifle or whatever it is. Obviously, that's it's come a long way, right? You can get match quality, highly accurate rifles built now with off-the-shelf components. But generally speaking, the specs on the AR-15 parts and how they ride in keyways and you know, in operational procedures in the firearm are, you know, a lot looser than what you're going to find with like a high level match bolt gun or something that's made for long range precision shooting uh, on a purpose built, built foundation. Of course, you're not getting, you know, sub half minute of angle accuracy out of most ARs, but you know, with such a loose specification, you get a lot more reliability and you got, you got a lot more room for error. So you can have some mistakes there. I mean, this gun was originally designed for infantry people, right? It has to be the lowest common denominator. Not that our infantry is stupid, but what can go wrong will go wrong in the field. And when you've got water and dirt and mud and other things that are introduced, sand that are introducing themselves into the actions of your firearm, it's not a great climate for precision or for um, reliability. So the AR-15, you know, is in its own class on that level. I mean, almost. I hate to be picking one side or the other, but almost as good, you know, from a longevity and a uh, reliability perspective as an AR, as an AK, right? And I'm not picking the AK over the AR per se. I mean, the AR has come a long ways in the last 15 years, but generally speaking, both of those guns are highly reliable under crazy circumstances. So lube is not going to be that much of an issue, but if you're feeling lube on your face or your arms or your hands when you're shooting, it's too much in your AR period. So look into that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're going to want to use a surface treatment that, that makes sense for you. You're, you're really only going to put it in dabs or spots where there's actual friction contact, right? A lot of the components and the specifications on the parts on the internals of the R15 have so much room for movement that the only places you really need to use. And honestly, you probably need 10 drops on the entire gun, right? I mean, in this particular platform, very few parts interact with each other on a regular, right? And those parts that do interact with each other on a regular don't require active lubrication. They require enough lubrication to get the job done. But where those parts are going to contact, lubrication is almost always going to be cause for concern more than it is to help with functionality. Clearly, if you pull your trigger and you hear it creaking as you pull it, it needs a dab or, or two of oil, right, or grease. Um, but if your firearm is functioning properly and it doesn't sound like metal on metal contact, like when you push your brakes and your pads are too low and the rivets from your brake pads are grinding into your rotor on your, you know, SUV, then you're probably not 
in a world of hurt, right? So a few spots of contact that are important, you know, obviously those places where powder or gas is exchanged, uh, particularly the breech face, particularly the bolt head components, particularly the gas uh, interaction, you're not going to want to over lube that. In fact, the only lube you should put on that, if at all, is to lube it and then wipe it off. All you need is corrosion resistance in, in most cases there. Uh, anything more than that, aside from regular maintenance, anything more than that is going to cause you to gum up and foul those mechanisms much easier and will cause you the malfunctions and the lack of reliability. So from a lubrication perspective, never forget that lubrication should be understated. It should not be overstated. So important, but not like everyone's taught you it is. Um, especially with the AR-15, the AK, and those others that have loose tolerances on the internal components. Uh, or those that are gas-driven, right? If you've got a gas-driven gun where, you know, hot powder and, you know, unburnt powder and, and hot gases are coming in contact with bearing surfaces, you don't want to increase the ability for those hot gases and unburnt, you know, propellant to, to cake up and gum up the internal workings. So be careful about that. Now, um, aluminum and steel sometimes have issues with leaching. So you got to be careful how you uh, work on those components. If you've got a steel to an aluminum fit anywhere on your gun, which the AR-15 has several places that this happens, particularly you see this a lot when you introduce new lubrication or new areas with cleaning solvents and things like that, because the inherent chemicals in these types of things like lubricants and solvents will cause a, a dissimilar metal reaction. So you can see actually it kind of, sometimes it looks like, you know, like a fungus growing on the aluminum. And essentially what it is, is it's eating away at the anodization and into the actual soft part of the aluminum. And because of the dissimilar metals, it doesn't help it. And what happens sometimes, most of this is mitigated by better manufacturing techniques now and better material compositions, better finishing uh, processes. Uh, harder finishes, etc. But sometimes you'll see this in guns where the finish process isn't perfect, or where you have an older, you know, set of parts, or where you're not, you know, taking care to keep things dry and properly lubricated, uh, where you have dissimilar metal contact and that sort of thing. So be careful how you do that. And you're going to want to check mostly at the breech face. You're going to want to check mostly at the, tr you know, in the trigger areas where steel and aluminum are contacting by pins. Make sure that you don't have anything that's, you know, starting to get weird in those areas because those are two that are particularly important. But also under some of the crush washers and, and uh, screws to fit furniture to firearm. So anywhere where it gets super hot, where metal can expand and aluminum is particularly good at transferring heat energy. So what you'll see is a lot of expansion and contraction uh, where steel components are connected to aluminum components. So, you know, at the barrel washer, at the breech face, at the uh, components that interact with everything under the handguard, uh, those are areas where you might see dissimilar medical concerns and where you might see difficulty because of expansion and contraction between aluminum and steel. So keep an eye out on that. But again, this is not so much a maintenance concept from the podcast perspective it's what do you have on hand and what do you need to look out for um, maintenance is important right like you should be cleaning your gun every time you go out if you're not you're not taking good care of your of your farms if you shoot 20 rounds it's a different story right you don't necessarily need to clean a gun uh, that that had 20 rounds shot through it but if you're shooting 500 or 2,000 rounds and you're not cleaning every time you go out there's a real problem in fact at 500 plus rounds you might even do a small you know moderate cleaning halfway through your session at 2000 rounds. I can't imagine you're getting through 2000 rounds without major issues, at least clearing the breech face area of, you know, unburnt powder and propellant debris, you know, pieces of copper and brass, etc., lead. So those are important things to keep, keep in mind and having, you know, the right components to do that, you know, uh, carbon scrapers, uh, you know, dental tools sometimes work really well. Uh, toothbrushes, uh, even some some wire brushes I, because of the aluminum components in the AR-15, I'd probably stick to using nylon bristled brushes or using copper brushes or brass brushes. I, I wouldn't ever get into stainless steel wire brushes. However, there are some areas where stainless steel wire brushes, if they're super soft or, or fine wires, 
make sense. For instance, uh, the gas components, um, for instance, uh, suppressor components, those types of things where you might want to get a little more aggressive early on. But certainly those are high wear components. Those are components that are built to last. And those are components where you're going to see the damage caused by a stainless steel wire brush pretty quickly because it's gonna take off actual finish. And uh, because of the extreme heat, you're gonna notice that because the discoloration of what this, you know, when the heat gets into those areas. So the gas, gas areas, uh, you know, inside suppressors and silencers, that sort of thing, so. Okay, so, uh, what's important what needs to be cleaned every time you shoot you know um first of all you should never uh fire around that's not marked on a barrel right i mean obviously the fitment and interchange between 556 five, and 223 is is so close to almost be negligible but generally speaking uh you shouldn't fire a 223 or you shouldn't fire a 556 five, inside of a 223 two, barrel um, but many of these are marked as multi or many of them are marked as uh, at least spec to 5.56 and the SAMI specs are different and the throat uh, dimensions are different and the way that the rounds are built is different. So if if given the opportunity to shoot a, a 5.56 out of a 2.23 and it's marked for 2.23, that's not a recommendation. In fact, I would never recommend anybody put any cartridge into any breach that isn't marked to accept that cartridge period even if the the interchange is so minimal to to as you know to be almost negligible um in the case of the r15 i bet you the failure rate is quite low because these things are over engineered at the breach area uh you know the dimensions are, are super strong the materials they're using in the barrels and the components there are very high quality and the manufacturing techniques are incredible at this level you know at this point in time but again as a as a word to the wise as a rule of thumb never put a cartridge into a firearm that is not marked on the barrel to take or accept or to shoot out of the firearm uh so that's you know that's one way to look at it but um if you're seeing a lot of fouling inside of your breech face, inside of your the star area uh, at the breech, inside of the tops of your magazines, inside of your trigger group, um, you're probably using real crap ammunition. And I wouldn't rely on that stuff in a defensive you know scenario. Certainly, if you need to stock up on bulk ammunition because of whatever reason, whether it's just for plinking or whether it's just because you need to put some rounds in the closet or whether it's because you think there's a you know, a major issue coming geopolitically, uh, you know, whatever your reasoning is for stocking up on ammo, that's fine. But understand that when you have poor quality ammunition, it's going to lead to failures at a higher rate. So be aware of those things, just kind of look out to that. But generally, if you're using factory fresh rounds and you're cleaning every 500 rounds, you're probably okay. And I don't mean you have to deep clean at 500 rounds. I mean, you need to check the bore, you need to look for you know, buildup of copper and lead and fouling, but you also need to look at the buildup on the front of the bolt head you need to look at the extractor the ejector you need to look at the top of the magazine you need to look at uh the interior pull the full carrier assembly out and look for striations and other things uh, both in the chamber and the breech face and on the carrier body and on the inside uh, railways of of the upper receiver uh, those types of things you can also look for severe damage near the buffer cup that holds in the uh the buffer in the the stock tube so that's important to look there just to see if you're having you know major blunt force damage or you've got striations from you know steel uh cartridges or something like that that are causing problems even brass cartridges can cause striations under pressure um you know the average barrel is probably between 46 rockwell and 60 rockwell in some places uh on the c scale and yet brass which is not even registering on the c scale it's, it's done on a different scale for hardness because it's so much softer can still cause striations or difficulties under pressure with as much powder as the 223 and the 556 hold in it so that's important to understand um okay and again i think maybe some of this is a little technical for some of this audience and so we apologize you know if, if this is a little over your head um, we invite you to ask questions you know both on the website that this is posted on and through the channels that we're building to support this podcast and give us feedback on whether this is helpful information or whether this is something you think is just overkill. 
because you know I could probably talk for days about ammunition and fouling inside of an AR-15 and it probably would be interesting to seven people so for all seven of you out there listening we appreciate it um, I think it's important too though that you're aware of how your gun functions so you need to shoot your gun relatively regularly right understand what it's doing understand what it's supposed to look like understand what normal wear and tear is understand where normal wear points are like on the outer railways that are precision cut on the outside of the uh, carrier assembly uh, like the back of the magazine like the top of the magazine well like the top of the trigger um, the breech face the extractor those are things you're gonna see wear and shiny metal on what is a deformation what is a you know change in normal behavior what does it sound like when a you know cartridge doesn't go off properly knowing these things is gonna is gonna help you mitigate most of your potential disasters when it comes to having some you know some ability to maintain your firearms in an extended system down scenario somewhere where you couldn't get parts or you couldn't have access to a gunsmith and that sort of thing luckily for those that are shooting an ar-15 most of this stuff is able to be done at the armor level or below in fact a lot of uh people who you could hear how raw this podcast is because i think i just had an alarm go off in the background there uh a lot of people who maintain their own firearms you know from the R- ar-15 perspective or you know substantially similar uh, modular sporting rifles you're gonna see a lot of dr- you know plug and play type of components and it's very easy to fix concerns by replacing parts and that is really the way that this modular concept was built upon in in the armed forces so that it could be done in the field quickly uh while maintaining a parts inventory that made sense instead of having to custom fit everything or fix everything so uh if you see any kind of case head separation meaning the the back area of the cartridge separates from the body of the cartridge uh, if you have anything that can't be fixed by re-racking the slide or by pushing the forward assist uh, or the charging handle, uh, you're going to need to stop and take stock of that. Probably at least field strip the firearm and make sure that uh, you know there's not something obvious that's causing a problem. If you see tons of cases being dinged or dented the wrong way, if you see tons of cases with lots of striations or marks or carvings in the side of them, uh, you see any kind of nicking on, you know, like like gouging on the brass or the steel that you're using or on any of the breech face components, uh, that's important. If something doesn't feel right, if it feels like it went in too heavy, too hard, take a look and see if there's fouling in the way, check, take a look and see if there's uh, a case, you know, that wasn't sized properly, check and see if there's something that hasn't been caught uh, from a fouling or debris perspective in the, in the chamber, the breech face those areas uh certainly as an obstruction to the barrel you have any obstructions in the barrel it's you know it's deadly it can be deadly it it is deadly so you need to check those clear those and make sure that they make sense um but yeah so if you have any of those types of things if you have multiple extraction failures in a single mag if you have multiple feed failures in a single in a single mag you know you should be looking at uh the magazine you should be looking at the uh cartridges you should be looking at the chamber you should be looking at the uh, breech face should be looking at all of those things that come in contact with the bolt head and see if there's an issue that's causing that. Uh, Generally speaking, 90% of the problems come from either excess fouling, low spring tension, or some obstruction in the breech face area, right? Or a broken part. 99% of all fixes on a, in a real-time scenario for the AR-15, probably cut, man, maybe 90%, 90 plus percent come from those areas. So check those first, you know, and take a look and make sure that you're keeping things clean. Um, breaking in a barrel, I don't know that that necessarily matters a ton to a ton of you, especially if you're hearing this after the fact. But if you're if you're going to try and break in a barrel for match shooting or for high accuracy shooting or to keep the longevity, it's important to kind of clean as you go, keep it oiled. But you don't need to be too crazy. Uh, you can use lapping compound if you know what you're doing and you have the right tools to do it. But for those that get too aggressive with the lapping compound, you can actually cause difficulties in the gas system. You can cause difficulties with variances in velocities, and you can cause difficulties with uh, excess pressures in the barrel that can cause all kinds of concerns up to and including 
you know, deadly explosions. So be careful when you're breaking in a barrel. If it's something you're not familiar with, get familiar with it if you really want to do it. And make sure you're you're taking it a tiny step at a time. This breaking in a barrel doesn't take a lot of aggressiveness. It takes a lot of attention to detail and a few rounds, maybe up to 20, 50 rounds at most. And really most barrels are broken in probably within 15 to 20 rounds. So, you know, for those that want to talk about, you know, breaking in a barrel, we might make an article in the future or, or talk about it on this podcast, uh, you know, as far as real high end precision shooting. But from the AR's perspective, unless you're trying to do, you know, 450 plus yard shots, you know, with some of the, the longer action, you know, cartridges like the 6.5 or something like that, uh, it's not going to make a ton of sense for a 5.56, right? Like that's not necessarily the wheelhouse of those that are trying to break in barrels for, for accuracy. But, uh, you know, take it step by step. Um, so, again, talking a little bit about, you know, the biggest concerns that you might have when you have compromise reliability or when you're seeing errors in, in your overall shooting uh, as far as malfunction. Uh, the first thing that you'll look at is weak springs, you know, uh, bad ammo, uh, missized ammo, um, poor maintenance, you know, uh, too much debris. Uh, potentially chipping or cracking on the bearing surfaces, uh, gas tube bending. You know, if you're too rough with your gun, if you're if you're doing running gun stuff or carbine, you know, classes or something like that, where your gun's getting shaken around a lot, uh, it's possible. You know, even you know one thirty second of an inch or you know fractions of millimeters off uh, when you hit something against the ground could cause major issues in the way that the direct impingement or even the gas system work. Um, gas adjustment, you know, like if you run a full gas system, the gas adjustment's important. You need to understand how that works. Uh, but poor handling of the firearm, you know, too much lube that's attracting too much debris. These are all really simple things that are pretty common. Weak mag springs is like my number one. You know, if, you, if you're having a feeding or an extraction problem, um, weak mag springs can be part of the issue. If you're having an issue with um, anything that has to do with cartridges is not seeding fully. It's almost always a debris concern or a lube concern, meaning either too much where debris has been caked up or too little because you're not focusing on putting lube in those areas generally, right? Like you don't necessarily need to put lube into the chamber. Could you? Yes. When you put it away in the closet after you clean it, yes. Or the gun safe, yes. You should do that to protect the, the metal. But generally speaking, if you're shooting a firearm and you've got oil in the barrel, that's, that's a mistake. That's not what a barrel was made to do, and it's not necessarily something you need to do when you're shooting copper or lead even through a, uh, a barrel. So minimize the lube on the chamber and the rifling just generally, unless you're putting it in storage. Um, Another thing would be modified buffer springs, uh, you know, changing cyclic rates, uh, trying to go ultra light or ultra heavy on buffer weights, that sort of thing. Uh, if you're tuning to a suppressor or a silencer type of setup, those are things that can cause issues if you have even the slightest thing go differently. So you would, I would generally tune an upper to go with a silencer, or I would generally tune an upper that would go with a specific buffer tube or cyclic rate for tension or weight uh, and keep it separated. That's important to do. Uh, and if you're doing those types of things shooting, that probably makes sense anyway. And you probably have enough expendable income that you're you're buying multiple uppers and fitting them on lowers or you're buying multiple guns for purpose build, you know, builds. So anyway, basic maintenance cycles for the AR-15. Every 250 rounds, you, you know, take a look at it, you know, wipe it down, you know, make sure there's not a ton of debris. Obviously, you're looking at the lugs and the bolt face. You're looking at the extractor. You're looking at the chamber and the feed areas, the bore, uh, the stuff that you can see exposed from a field strip on the gas system. Uh, you know, wipe them down, dust them down. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily lube them even. If they're not running dry, you don't necessarily need to. A dab or two of oil or, or a smear of grease is probably more than enough on some of those surfaces. Um, also, every 500 rounds, another visual check, you know, being able to kind of look at the magazines for excessive debris, uh, you know, looking at uh, the first 
couple of inches of compression in the magazine, taking a look at the hammer trigger sear, you know, just at a visual level and, you know, having a flashlight is probably helpful. Um, paying attention to the level of debris that's being deposited on the breech face in the star, uh, you know, on the bolt face on the outside of the carrier at the gas system, those types of things. So, um, you could use additional lubrication here if it makes sense, but I would almost always bring like a microfiber towel or, or a, a cotton or linen towel to wipe down those areas first and then apply lube and then wipe that down as well. Just so you're putting a light film of lubrication. Um, every thousand rounds, you know, a full clean makes absolute sense. I, I would say clean it every time you come home from the range, uh, generally, especially just to, you know, put some corrosion resistance on some of the exposed parts parkerizing and some some oxidized uh pieces and the anodization is going to keep most of the control over the corrosion for an ar-15 but certainly if you're just using something that's blued with a standard black oxide finish or something like that there's definitely the chance for potential for rust and corrosion uh but generally those are you know not big issues as long as you're not handling them you know in is acidic environments or you don't live in humid environments humid environments like next to the seashore and that sort of thing uh every 2500 rounds you know you're checking for excessive wear and tear you're looking for mushrooming on edges you're looking for excessive copper fouling you're looking for anything that shows that you're shaving parts off of the off of the projectile within the breach area uh you're you're looking at uh tightness of you know the different components you're looking at mechanical fasteners not backing out you know making sure that they're continuing to stay in place uh excessive play and springs and pins and that sort of thing is important every 5,000 rounds you're checking the barrel the bore for excessive wear you're looking for uh deviations in the lands and grooves that get rid of the concentricity in the torsional length of the in, in the length of the uh land of the rifling so you're looking for anything that would show deviation or chipping or edge cutting or breaking on those lands and grooves that could be a problem that could cause excess pressure in the bore uh you're gonna disassemble at every 5,000 rounds it's beyond your normal field stripping you're gonna you know, deep clean it, you're going to use solvents in some of the areas and you're going to try and blow out excess solvent and lubrication and, you know, properly pamper the gun every 5,000 rounds and the thing is going to last, you know, pretty, pretty long time. Uh, every 10,000 rounds, you're probably going to be uh, doing spring changes. You're probably going to be doing at least on buffers and magazines. Um, you're probably going to uh, check the, cha the trigger hammer sear for excess wear you're going to be looking for tolerance concerns in the pinholes you're going to be uh, making sure that you don't have any multi-shot bursts you know two three four shot bursts when you're not expecting it right anytime you have uh that kind of round count through a firearm that's held together of dissimilar metals you're going to have the chance for excess uh specification you know kind of growing you're going to have internal components that are going to be smaller in a smaller space or in a larger space than they're supposed to be and so those you know ha half of a thousandth can mean the difference between uh, a gun firing two or three rounds instead of firing the one it's supposed to on a sear face uh, or on you know a ledge on the hammer or trigger so you're going to be looking at those types of things to make sure that fitment is correct uh, and, and anytime as a consumer or as a normal civilian shooter that you don't have the expertise to diagnose this, make sure you get with somebody that has the expertise to do that, whether it's a gunsmith, whether it's an armor, whether it's a good friend that has a lot more experience than you, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, so basically a trusted resource within the environment that can tell you yes or no, you have this problem. Yes or no, you need to, you know, replace these parts. Uh, usually most of these things that come in the modular format can be told from a visual inspection. If you have a crack, replace the part. If you have mushrooming on the edge, replace the part. If you have loose fitment where there should not be loose fitment, like in the hammer tr trigger sear engagement, replace the part. If you have specifications out of specification, replace the part, period. Because these are, these are meant to have some specification looseness, but they're not meant to have excess specification looseness. 
So I think it's important when you look at it from that perspective. Anytime you see a bulge or a ring in the barrel, uh, you need to stop shooting immediately and don't test it, right? That probably means that you had a round staged, or like a squib round or something staged in the barrel, and then something was shot after it. And what's happened is it's caused backup pressure behind the projectile. And even though it might not have exploded, it's now been weakened or cracked in that area and has a high likelihood of, of being a destructive force going forward. You know, another shot or two or 10 or whatever it takes. Uh, if you're not looking at that, anytime you have a bulge or a ring, you need to stop using that barrel, period. So anytime you see something like that or think that you might have seen something like that, check your barrel, check your bore. Make sure that you don't have a ring, a bulge, some sort of weird striation inside of the bore. And if you do, stop shooting. It's just not worth it. So having an extra barrel on hand makes some sense. I think most of the barrels that I've seen really are going to get past 12 to 15,000 rounds pretty easily. As long as you're not rapid fire, high heat shooting through those barrels, not all barrels are created equally, right? So having a backup barrel can be important, but I would say you're going to have components fail way before the barrel, right? The barrel's a static component on the AR-15. You're going to have gas tubes fail way before the barrel. You're going to have um, magazine springs way, fail way before the barrel. You're going to have bolts that fail almost uniformly before the barrel does. Uh, the carrier can even, you know, get cracks or tension concerns or striations, uh, or even the upper receiver generally is going to fail before the barrel fails. Now, your mileage is going to vary on that one, right? Your mileage may vary, as they say, because it depends on your shooting style. It depends on the ammunition. It depends on how high a heat you're using. It depends how rapid fire you're using it. It depends on the quality of the material to begin with in the barrel. It, it depends on the heat treatment. It depends on the, the rifling style. It depends on the manufacturer. A lot of these things are going to be factors that, that uh, factor into the longevity of that barrel. But generally speaking, they're going to last that long, you know, 12,000, 15,000, maybe even up to 20,000 rounds before you start seeing massive changes in accuracy or reliability. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is pretty much a wrap up of that. I would say the last thing I would be concerned with if it were me looking from a preparedness mindset of what parts to have on hand, what kind of maintenance to do, how to kind of like keep, you know, checks and balances on the reliability and the longevity of my AR-15 or my modern sporting rifle that's, you know, substantially similar, whatever the model, you know, calls it. A uh, manufacturer might call the uh, model something different, but it's substantially similar to the AR-15. Um, the only thing I would say last and, and most importantly for those that are super hardcore is if you've modified a firearm heavily or if you're shooting, say, to include a suppressor or lower cyclic rates or change gas pressure or change uh, extremes on the weight, whether heavy or light, you need to take extra concern on um, what we've talked about today on this podcast and, and look into how you might fix those problems uh, at a higher rate of failure. Because when you're shooting suppressors, when you're shooting lower cyclic rate firearms, when you're shooting higher cyclic rate firearms, when you're you know, in extreme heat conditions where you're firing 400 rounds off in quick succession, those things will significantly enhance wear rates compared to regular shooters that are shooting one round every two or five or 10 seconds or one round every minute. You know, if you're shooting 400 rounds in, in four minutes, that's a lot of heat buildup. There's a lot of heat exchange. There's a lot of expansion and contraction, and there are a lot of things that can go wrong. And when you put a suppressor on the end, you're putting localized heat in different areas. When you're putting a suppressor on the end and you're adjusting gas uh, rates of flow, and you're talking about uh, cyclic rate differences because of weights or because of balances or because of spring pressures, those are all things that will enhance wear and tear on a firearm, specifically on the AR-15. So anyway, hopefully this was useful for those that like the, the more technical aspects of it or who you know, don't have a good overall viewpoint of how to maintain or keep that preparedness mindset when it comes to your AR-15. Uh, obviously, I feel like it might have been a little long-winded, but hopefully you've gained something from it. Give us your feedback, and we're looking forward to seeing you next time when we talk about things on this podcast. All right, bye-bye. So here at the end of the episode, we want to uh, introduce ourselves. I'm a 
SEO and digital marketing consultant. I'm a business consultant that happens to have a background uh, for most of my life in gunsmithing, the gun industry, firearm shooting, 2A politics, that sort of thing. And uh, thought, hey, I'm really not that smart when it comes to uh, things that can hurt me. So uh, why not do a podcast about guns and put myself out there to get teased by everybody on the internet? Uh, anyway, so I'm too stubborn not to keep doing this, and we probably need to get the bills paid, and let's see if seven or more people like this style of podcast, but I just wanted to introduce uh, what we're going to do and what we're going to talk about, and if you have a chance to check out the type of work we do or you need something in the gun industry that requires a subject matter expert, content writers, that sort of thing, uh, we have a business. It's called republicofcompany.com, republicofcompany.com, and we do a lot of business with the firearms industry and uh, write a lot of content. We'll probably write 15 million words, maybe even up to 18 million words for the gun industry this year alone. Uh, so you can check us out, our digital agency and uh, business consulting practice at republicofcompany.com. We look forward to uh, doing a podcast for you guys in the gun industry and kind of opening up some ideas uh, surrounding the business of guns or some of the background stuff that maybe you don't get insight to uh, a lot of the time with the mainstream gun podcasts and mainstream gun articles and content that's out there on the internet, uh, including stuff on YouTube and all that. So we're looking forward to doing this. Obviously, as you can tell, it's going to be minimally edited. It's kind of a stream of consciousness thing. Uh, hopefully it's well received. And if it's not, I'm again, probably too stubborn to stop doing it. So uh, if you hate us, let us know how we can fix it and uh, tell us what you'd like to hear about. And we'll try and get better as we go. And uh, hopefully uh, you guys hate my, le my voice a lot less than I do. All right. We appreciate you listening. This inaugural episode of this gun podcast that we don't have a name for yet is sponsored by a company that we're affiliated with that happens to be in the Second Amendment and gun industry space. And you can check out their website by inputting this link into your browser. The number 2, nda.link slash 1ac. So the number 2, nda.link slash 1ac.